<clears throat> last talk. So Martin uh, decided to put this in academia, and actually this is uh, more of a hobby of, of than, than my actual work. So what we wanted to work with, with my colleague Enrico Ribula, um, is uh, using a very high stability clock source, which is uh, the DCF77 low frequency, uh, very low frequency emitter in, in Germany, for uh, measuring uh, ionosphere uh, altitude variations. Uh, and that was actually decided during one of our barbecue parties in the lab when uh, Enrico was discussing with me about his PhD on uh, measuring Lorentz uh, signals and s being able to separate the ionospheric uh, wave from the surface ground uh, propagating wave. So basically what we wanted to say is, okay, he did this like 25, 30 years ago as a PhD. Can we do it nowadays with a sound card? So that was the original insight into this topic. And maybe some of you remember that a couple of years ago I discussed uh, GPS reception. Now GPS is a bit challenging because it's below uh, terminal noise. Uh, you cannot see it on a, on a spectrum analyzer. But the basic insight was that if you could c uh, collect the raw carrier signal from the GPS, well, GPS is basically a collection of uh, uh, atomic uh, clocks in the space, and you could do some nice physics. So a bit later now, I, uh, uh, Laurent Listarki here from, from CNES uh, has published in one of his reviews what physics you can do uh, on, on GPS usage, and this is all based on, on GNSS SDR. Uh, so basically what the insight in this work is if you have a very high stability clock and because frequency is a physical quantity that you can measure with the highest resolution, then maybe you can do something fun. And so in this context, what we wanted to look at is uh, looking at DCF77 as uh, a signal source that is locked or disciplined on the PTB, so the German uh, National Metrology uh, Center, uh, atomic clocks, cesium clocks. And actually that was all started during the uh, EFTS, the European Frequency and Time Seminar that is organized in Besançon every summer, uh, when Andreas Bauer, actually the acknowledgement is, is here below, showed us one of his uh, slides where he was presenting the code system that was uh, implemented in DCF77. So you might know that DCF77 is one of these em radio frequency emitters that allows you to synchronize uh, some of these low-cost uh, weather station clocks. And this is just done by uh, uh, amplitude modulation, I'll show you a bit later. But what Andreas showed during his presentation was that if you just look at the carrier with this amplitude modulation, you have a narrow band signal, which is basically just the timing signal once every second, and you're not going to do good uh, uh, positioning with this because you have a very high stability frequency but your timing capability is very poor because nothing looks more similar from one sign period than another sign period so you have no timing capability and what they did at PTB or the people working running uh, DCF 77 is that uh, they uh, added uh, a pseudo random uh, phase noise over the uh, carrier which is amplitude modulated and when you've been working for a year on GPS and reading all the documentation of GPS that just jumps on you as, as a, a typical uh, sp uh, spectrum spreading using phase modulation and pseudo random phase modulation so when we had a look at this with Enrico we said we have to try to do this and do this as easy as possible so what we want to do here is to have a access to the uh, a raw signal from DCF77 and implement not the basic amplitude modulation detection that everyone has been doing maybe, but uh, the more fancy phase modulation detection. And why did we do this? Well, if you look at the literature, it's been very well known, and I think that people are forgetting this a little bit. Actually, I, I have never been introduced to this before, this work, is that in the 60s, people were very much interested in very low frequency propagation. They were looking at ionosphere altitude because they have, these waves are bouncing over the ionosphere. And if you look in the older literature, you see that between daylight and, and nighttime, sorry, nighttime and daytime, uh, ionosphere uh, changes altitude because ionization uh, due to uh, cosmic rays from the sun uh, will uh, change the electronic density in the ionosphere. And basically you have a 20 kilometer altitude variation in addition to a uh, reflection capability change due to electron density. So what we want to do here in this work is we have this very high stability clock source located in Manfling in Germany and we are located in Besançon, 370 kilometers away, and we have this beautiful uh, cesium-locked oscillator that generates a carrier wave with a 50 kilowatt emitter, um, and we wonder whether we could do something more interesting than simply synchronizing a weather station clock by looking at the time of flight of this uh, wave, and this requires, of course, accurate timing because carrier frequency is one story, but if you want to do some timing, you need to have some sort of uh, time of flight measurement, and this is where the carrier phase uh, measurement will uh, be involved. 
So just to get an order of magnitude, what are we looking for? We are considering uh, DCF-77, 370 kilometer 370 km away from me, uh, a ground wave propagating around 100 microseconds. And if you make this wave bounce over the ionosphere, uh, it will take another 100 microseconds additional to go to the ionosphere and back to me. And if the ionosphere moves by about 20 km, you could expect some variation of day to night uh, variation of about an additional 95 microseconds. So the question is, can we time the signal generated by DCF-77 received in, in Besançon by better than or much better than 100 microseconds? That, that's a question uh, with a few uh, approximations. We you consider that the wave is propagating at uh, velocity in, in a vacuum and you, you assume that the ground wave is, uh, delay is negligible with respect to what we're looking at. So that, that's really the, the, the objective of this work. So the first thing I would like to introduce, I know this is not a top session about antennas, but again, for someone who's been raised with uh, VHF antenna, microwave antenna, for me, an antenna is a 50 ohm uh, or 75 ohm piece of wire, which is usually resonant. And when you go back to this three kilometer wavelength signal, any antenna will be much, much shorter than the wavelength. And if you go back in the literature, you know, or you might find that such antennas are necessarily high quality factor antennas, which for someone uh, raised in VHF and SHF uh, is usually a poor thing. You don't like high resonance uh, antenna because they are narrow band and usually we want wide band uh, signals to have a lot of, uh, signal, uh, a lot of uh, information content, uh, like Shannon told us. And so on the one hand, we have these narrow band antennas, but actually narrow band is good for SDR because narrow band in SDR will allow you to select only one signal and get rid of all the very old, the very low frequency signals that might uh, prevent us from receiving DCF-77. So we have this high quality factor antenna, which is simply a coil, uh, which is uh, made resonant. The other thing that is not usual to us, or at least to me, is that these antennas are very high impedance. If you calculate the impedance at anti-resonance of this system, it's 175, 125 kilo, kilo ohm. So you need an adapt adaptation uh, uh, circuit, so just fill the effect transistor that has a very high impedance that will generate a low impedance output, and this you can feed directly to the sound card of your PC. Now if you do this in the lab, well, you get a lot of signals, basically because your cathode ray uh, screen is uh, generating signal, your switching uh, supplies are generating, that was the first discussion uh, this morning. So you need to take the antenna outdoor. So you go through the uh, emergency exit uh, outdoor uh, uh, that get, gets out of my lab, put the antenna outside, and if I put the antenna like three, five kilometer away from the lab, then I get my signal from DCF-77. So at least with respect to GPS, with DCF-77, I can take a spectrum analyzer and just have a look at the signal and I see it. So now I have a signal, I want to decode it. So I steal a lock-in amplifier from one of my colleagues, I take a synthesizer, and I simply generate 77.5 kilohertz, the DCF-77 carrier frequency, and surely enough, on the oscilloscope, I see my amplitude modulated signal. These are the amplitude uh, drops every, once every second. And I have the phase information, which is, comes out of the lock-in, and because there's no reason for this receiver to be locked to a cesium uh, clock, uh, the local oscillator of this, uh, uh, of this uh, synthesizer has no reason to being locked on the cesium. Of course, you have a phase which depends on the thing we want to decode, plus a time varying uh, signal, which is the uh, uh, frequency offset, as we've just seen. But because I'm in a time and frequency lab, I'm lucky enough to have access to a cesium clock. So now I take a cesium clock, I lock the synthesizer on a cesium clock, and surely enough, PTB has a cesium clock which is locked to the Besançon Observatory uh, clock. Of course, these two clocks are used to generate time, so uh, these are synchronized, uh, or at least they have a very slow drift. So basically, we can get amplitude modulation, phase modulation, and this is just my uh, locking output, uh, my locking amplifier output. There's not much I can do out of this. So I take this uh, on an oscilloscope, I grab the oscilloscope signal, and by uh, recording the raw uh, signal from uh, DCF-77, can I extract amplitude phase, and if I get the phase, can I do a cross-correlation so that I can re recover my, my pseudo-random uh, information. So here is the 
pseudorandom code that has been uh, added at, on top of, uh, of uh, DCF77 carrier. So it's a pseudorandom, it's a 511 bit, so it's very similar to GPS. GPS is 10 bit, this one is 9 bit. Pseudorandom means that it doesn't repeat over this 511 uh, sequence, and you have a plus or minus 13 degree phase variation, as opposed to GPS, which is 100, uh, plus or minus 100, uh, 0, 180. This is just a very tiny phase variation, plus or minus 13 degree. So you generate this code. This is uh, stolen from the uh, DCF77 web page uh, from Wikipedia. You generate the code. You load the code. You resample your signal to have as many ones and zero as you have samples in each bit. You cross-correlate. And surely enough, this is one of these Eure Eureka day where everything works nicely. Once every second, you've got one of these peaks coming out, cross-correlation peak. And you might say, no, this is just noise. Well, if you zoom into one of these peaks, you have a real cross-correlation uh, signal that is uh, significant. So this is an example of getting the signal by uh, cross-correlating my pseudo-random code over the phase information that I've recorded, and I can get a nice timing signal. Uh, and if you wonder, if you wonder why we're doing this, this is the amplitude modulation. I zoomed into the amplitude modulation. This is one of my cross-correlation peaks. If you look at this over one minute, this is what you have. Once every second, you have a drop in amplitude. Once every second, you have a cross-correlation peak. And if you look at them, you see that obviously we're going to have a much better timing accuracy with such a signal than with this one. If you do this over one minute, you see that you have a beautiful cross-correlation peak, which is very narrow. And here you have this broad drop of the amplitude. So basically, what has been published earlier is that you have at least a 10 times, 10 fold improvement in timing capability by using the phase cross correlation as opposed to amplitude modulation. Okay, so so far I've shown off with my fancy instruments. I have an experiment which is a few thousand euro and you need a cesium clock. Quite a few people here will not be able to, be, to, to perform it. So now let's go to uh, uh, software defined radio. I want to do this now. I have my locking amplifier with my cesium locked uh, source, and I want to compare the result with a sound card. And again, my sound card has a local oscillator, which has no reason of being locked on, on cesium. So I need to uh, compare my sound card recording with some sort of time reference. And the obvious time reference is one PPS, one pulse per second coming from the GPS. I have one of these cheap uh, U-Blox uh, receivers. Uh, U-Blox is a Swiss company making very uh, good GPS receivers. This is a, for 80, 80 euro, you can get a, a phase output, uh, a phase lock um, GPS receiver, which are one PPS signal, which is, I measured it to be plus or minus 30 nanoseconds. So you have a very good time reference. And so again, we do the same thing. We have our audio signal because I have a sound card that can record at 192 kilohertz. Uh, I am within uh, Nyquist's theorem of, of uh, two samples for a 77.5 kilohertz carrier frequency. I do a frequency translating fear filter, and uh, I just record magnitude and phase out of this signal. And if I do this, I will try to tune the frequency translating fear filter so that I get, well, I compensate for this 192 kilohertz offset from the wanted frequency. Now, as I just mentioned during the, the session panel, one of the things that always baffles me with this translating fear filter is, should I put plus 77 or minus 77? I always do it wrong and I have to try it twice. What is the sign of the frequency offset that you have to put in the frequency fear filter? <coughs> and somehow in this case, it worked whatever I put, plus or minus 77.5. And this is obvious once you realize that you've recorded a real signal. This is not an IQ output, a complex output. It's a real signal. A, sign a real signal is even. So you have the same uh, component on the positive frequency and the negative frequency. So whether you put plus 77 or minus 77, you always having, uh, end up having one of the information components into the baseband. And so for this once, we can do whatever we want, plus or minus sign, and you end up having a, a nice signal. So you do this, and the first time you do this, you get once every second uh, the amplitude drop, and this is your phase phase from the uh, recording, and you try playing with this delta f that you cannot read here. So I, originally, I'm slightly off frequency with an offset of zero hertz. I try to move it closer, so let's say one hertz. We're so removing this phase offset. We're getting better. Whoops, I went too far. And at the end, you can compensate for the phase offset of, uh, uh, due to the, the, the difference between local oscillator of a sound card and DCF77. So 15 ppm is not too bad. It's much better than most DVB-T receivers. So now I can get my 
uh, phase information, and again, same story. Uh, I have my one PPS, one, my one pulse per second from GPS. I have my amplitude signals. Somehow, I don't know why, but if I do have two sources, I get out of sync sometimes in, in the, gra the graphical display. I don't know why. And the green is, is the phase. So I don't want, I'm going to show you, I've been running this since October. So I don't want to tune manually the frequency offsets every time. So what I did here is a very ugly, uh, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm recording using Gnu Radio and then I process in MATLAB. I have easier uh, thought in, in Octave rather than, than working directly in C++. So I find it easier to record the data and, and then process them. So what I'm doing here is I'm recording the raw data. I'm uh, having a local oscillator, 77.5 kilohertz, and I'm shifting uh, by a, a, a discrete time uh, my, my DCF 77 signal, and I low pass filter, then I decimate. So basically here I reproduce the translating fear filter. That's easy enough. And then what I do is I make a, a coarse frequency offset measurement by taking the magnitude of a Fourier transform. And I say, OK, my Fourier transform is going to tell me by how much. It's, it's a very rough estimate, but by how much my local oscillator is offset with respect to DCF77. And I remove, uh, I, I create a local oscillator, which is exponential of J2pi, the, the, the off frequency offset times the discrete time. And I remove this uh, offset. And then once I've removed this coarse frequency offset, I make a linear fit of the phase, the resulting phase. And once again, I remove the average value of this linear fit of a phase, which is an accurate uh, or precise frequency difference estimate. And if I do this, I have my, my offset corrected phase information. If I cross correlate the signal, I get my beautiful cross correlation peaks once every second. So I can do the same thing we did with a lock-in amplifier, with a sound card, and all this will be referenced to the one PPS of GPS by a recording on a stereo sound card on one channel. I record DCF77. On the second channel, I record um, uh, GPS. And I can measure here the difference between GPS and one PPS. At some point, you sometimes have a slight offset of, of a phase. Sometimes you lose some of these cross correlation peaks. And your timing will go away. But if you run a median uh, filter on this thing, you will find the median value. And uh, it will give you a, a pre pretty good idea of what the phase, uh, the, so the timestamp is, so the time, the, the time delay is. And this is an example of a three-day measurement uh, where I have on top the uh, locking amplifier, so the, the high quality, high grade locking amplifier. And on the bottom, this is the output of my sound card. So you see that the results are pretty consistent. You have here daytime, nighttime. So indeed, I can measure some sort of fluctuation of the atmosphere during nighttime with respect to daytime. And what you cannot see here below the text is the resolution, the timing resolution is about nine microseconds. If you remember, I was claiming that the daytime to nighttime variation is about 100 microseconds, so we have 10 times better time resolution by using this uh, cross correlation technique. So this is um, what I want to say here. Um, this was done in September. Uh, this was my very first measurement in September. I had to leave for a three-week trip uh, in end of September, October. And unfortunately for you, I will not be able to show you any better result than this because since October it's been winter. In winter, ionosphere is not stable. And I have to wait for the spring to come back to have again these measurements. I was hoping that yesterday maybe the sun might uh, be uh, helpful. But no, not yet. We have to wait a few uh, more weeks before the ionosphere shows again this high stability during daytime. Now, one of the thing here is that not everyone has access to 192 kilohertz sound card. So of course, we all seen that we have these DVB-T receivers. And these DVB-T receivers, they also allow me to sample at 2 mega sample per second. So with 2 mega sample per second, I can timestamp the GPS 1 PPS with a much better accuracy because now I have some 500 nanosecond resolution. However, I'm losing in, in, in uh, quantification resolution because I'm going from a 16-bit sound card to an 8-bit A to D converter. So will the 8-bit A to D converter from the RTL 2832U be enough to get my signal out of, so my ground wave uh, out of my air, my air wave out of my ground wave? And we've seen that the antenna is a high quality factor bandpass filter. So will I be able to get rid of, uh, of a jammer here? So we did this. And actually, I'm putting this as a provocation for the uh, Osmo SDR people in the room because I couldn't get the direct sampling function to work with uh, the new radio block. And so what I did is this very ugly hack. I'm sorry, but uh, at least it works. Is I just uh, 
putting the Libertial SDR, uh, the fact that I'm using an E4000, E4000 is a tuner that is not using um, uh, uh, intermediate frequency. So by uh, setting your RTL SDR with such a, 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 a setting, you just tell it, record whatever sample you have and don't put any uh, frequency offset. And somehow this works. So uh, if there is a better way to do it, I would like, I, I think this is a very powerful way of using this RTL 2832U and it would be nice to either make sure that they work or uh, at least find some way of getting people use, using them. And so once you get this working, you have one I input, which is DCF77, the QR input, which is the GPS signal. And again, we do the same thing. I record for one minute, uh, once, every, once every minute, I record for duration of one minute, my sample of uh, GPS DCF77. I process my data and I will save them uh, by doing the same processing. I will not get into the details, but it's exactly the same story, except that you need to do well by Processing a two megahertz signal with a very narrow band, you, you, you are targeting a 700 kilohertz uh, bandwidth, you realize why you need to do multiple fear filter with decimation. And again, we go back to this whole DSP thing. You can take all the courses on DSP that you want. If you haven't realized that if you do directly two megahertz to 700 hertz, you have like 10,000 coefficients and that's not going to run efficiently, uh, when, then you haven't understood what DSP means. And so by doing this with practical signals, you really realize why you have to cascade fear filters with decimation steps in between. And so you do this again with your RTLSDR, and at some point you should have a chart displayed, but there's a lot of points on the next, next chart. So recording the, the data, you extract phase and magnitude. Again, I have my once every second amplitude information, my phase information, my GPS timestamp, the phase which doesn't look very good, but at least cross-correlation peaks come once every second here because I have a bit of leftover phase drift. My, I lose my cross-correlation and I get here my, uh, my cross-correlation peaks. So again, I can do my timing experiment and uh, I will be able to get a precise time of uh, timing, time stamping by using DVB-T. So even some of you who do not have a 192 kilohertz uh, sampling uh, audio sound card, you can reproduce this with 10 euro worth of equipment with an RTL-SDR uh, dongle. And again, by doing this, uh, we have a collection of, of uh, timing. So this is a conclusion of, of uh, this has been running since November. This is 6th of November. This was done yesterday. So what you see here, uh, here I changed my algorithm. So this is just a slight change in my algorithm. So what you see here is that phase, of course, uh, we're reference, we're, we are referring GPS to a clock which is used for defining UTC. So this, even though GPS is not officially linked to UTC, to so universal time, well, we, uh, we have good reasons to think that GPS will be uh, synchronized with UTC. So what you see here is over three months, you do not see any observable drift, which is well known from the metrology community. And every one of these dips here is another day. So day, night, day, night, each one of these like this. And if I plot an Allen deviation for those of you who are more into the time and frequency. So this is basically the stability of my uh, timing capability as a function of ta integration time. So this is going from one minute up to, well, three months. You see that you are at the 10 to the minus 7 down to 10 to the minus 11, which is about 1,000 times worse than what has been published by PTB. But I think I've spent much less than 1,000 times less than what they did in their experiment. And just to give you some hint, the red curve here is uh, a tuning fork. This is basically the stability of your watch. I took a, a tuning fork from a watch and I measured the stability. So what this chart tells you is that a tuning fork is very stable on the short term, but on the long term it's going to drift if only due to time, uh, temperature variation when I wear or I do not wear my, my watch. So over time the tuning fork is going to drift, whereas these two clocks that we're using here, the, the, the cesium locked clock uh, generated by, by DCF, is going to always uh, demonstrate better stability as the longer you integrate. And at some point you have this intersection course which tells you that below this your quartz watch will be better than uh, DCF77 and above so some time you should look at DCF77. This is basically what cesium atomic clocks are doing. You have high stability from the quartz oscillator on the short term and you lock your quartz oscillator on the atomic uh, transition. So basically what you can do with this sound card is get acquainted to what uh, people are doing when they try to design atomic clocks. So having various time sources and these time sources will give the best stability over various integration durations.
So basically what we showed here is that we have the ability to receive the CF77 uh, signal using an active antenna. We have been able to extract amplitude and phase information using a Latin amplifier. We've been able to reproduce these experiments with SDR, either with a, a, an audio sound card or with um, a DVB-T dongle. And we have consistent results. I'm eagerly waiting for a spring to get again a, a, ba a beautiful stable signal. I tried to correlate fluctuations in the DCF77 signal with X-ray density measured by geosynchronous satellites from NOAA, and there is no obvious uh, correlation. I believe that 77.5 kilohertz is a bit too high, and we're probing layers of uh, atmosphere that are too deep uh, to detect uh, what people are usually measuring with ionosonde, which are uh, lower frequency devices, 10, 15 kilohertz, where you really see the effect of, of X-ray uh, density variation on, on the uh, uh, ionic content of ionosphere. I do have a few questions, though, if uh, anyone uh, wants to pursue this thing. Uh, we're supposed to be told that you have two waves propagating on VLF, a ground wave and an ionospheric wave. That was the initial insight that the low run C allows you to distinguish these two waves. And if, as published by PTB, the ground wave is much stronger than the ionospheric wave, how come that my unique signal that I'm measuring is varying from day to night? This is a question for me. And I, I wonder whether you have to use a model, a waveguide model, where you have varying boundary conditions or whether you have truly two waves propagating. At the moment, I did everything on, on, a, on a PC. Uh, whether it's worth spending time putting all of this on a microcontroller is questionable, but it's, it's kind of fun and it's, it's not too difficult to do. So the next thing I would like to look at is uh, basically looking at the at the moment, I've just been looking at the position of a cross-correlation peak, but I have not in investigated the shape of a cross-correlation peak. And what I would expect is that if an air wave is slightly shifted with respect to the ground wave, what you should see is a broadening of a cross-correlation peak because you have two waves slightly time-shifted. You should remember that the phase bit is 1.5 milliseconds apart. It's 700 hertz. These are 100 microseconds time delay. So you will not be able to see the two cross-correlation peak separate, but you should be able to see some sort of cross-correlation peak broadening as a function of this uh, air wave and ground wave uh, separation. So this is still open uh, to question. So basically what I wanted to show you is that you can get involved into this uh, electrical phenomena in atmosphere, involved in this topic while uh, investigating uh, uh, surface, so software defined radio. Just, uh, I've, put it, I've put this, of course, the, the slides are on my website and on the FOSDEM website. Uh, there, is, there has been a very uh, extensive uh, literature on, on this topic, but I haven't seen anyone trying to tackle the issue of can anyone reproduce these experiments. Usually these are very fancy experiments with rather fancy equipment, and uh, I believe that uh, this is a topic that would be worth investigating by more people, uh, especially because very low frequency communication has lost uh, some of its appeal since uh, everyone is looking at, at high, high bandwidth uh, transmissions and nevertheless low frequency is a very um, uh, amusing topic. So with this I thank you for staying all the way to the end of the talk and if there is any question I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Before we do questions, just on your way out, look around you, pick up all the trash, glass goes in bins in the hallways. And trash goes here. Hopefully it's not overflow. Thank you. Thank you. The design of your ADL, was it a commercial or was it sales field? Is your dongle? The, the, the dongle is, uh, actually I heard 20 euro. I, I, I buy mine for 8 euros actually. Uh, this is just one of these 8 euro dongles. And you just uh, have to unsolder the two capacitance and put an SMA connector instead. Um, have you got some designs somewhere that we can play with? Um, what I, I, it's like the previous presenter. I, I believe that in academia we are not careful enough to make something that other people can use. I would be very happy to put on the website uh, all my Octave script. It might be that you have to send me an email so I can tell you how it works because they're, not, they're definitely not plug and play. But I would be very happy to send them to you. Okay. Your academics need to get that <laughs> out of you and just put the code up on GitHub. <laughs> we'll do so. Yeah. I'm surprised that you can receive DCF on a sound card because although uh, you meet light risk area, there should be input filters that, uh, and even digital processing in your sound card that doesn't allow you to understand or how all into your sound system. I have a 192 kilohertz sound card. Yes. I'm well below half the sampling frequency. Yes. 
why wouldn't my sound card allow me to record this? Well, the fact is that it doesn't. <laughs> Luckily enough, it doesn't. Okay, well, I tried it on, uh, the lab is fitted with Dell laptops. I tried it on two Dell laptops, it works. And on Panasonic laptops, it works. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah. Uh, so you cross-correlated your receive, uh, receive signals with the PR, uh, with the third random? Um, um, to the random number, yeah. Yeah, so um, what about... I mean, uh, and then you do a, uh, a frequency correction to amount for like the error of that intensity. So, um, couldn't you just like use the autocorrelation of the received signal because? Oh. The first time I did this, before I was even sure that my pseudo-random number generator was correct, the first thing I did was I auto-created to see if I could get my peaks once every second. Um, the question about using directly the, auto, the because then once I got my autocorrelation, I wanted the cross-correlation to work. Like with GPS, you can only get the cross-correlation if you correct for a phase. And, and then I forgot returning back to the autocorrelation. Uh, I wonder whether what you can grab out of the autocorrelation it could be. Uh, but at some point, I want to compare this autocorrelation with a GPS tag. Yeah. Uh, and then I need to uh, have my, uh, my copy, my local copy, that I will uh, uh, phase align with my, with my GPS. So at some point, by taking external, I think the autocorrelation will tell me whether I got the right signal and whether I get a peak every, once every second. But if, if I want to synchronize with an external source, which is the one PPS, then I need to run a local copy of my oscillator uh, or my, my sort, of random sort of random number generator and, and, and phase synchronize this as we do in GPS. But the, the autocorrelation is beautiful, actually. Uh, this is completely off topic, but I was, I've been spending the last three weeks working on R RDS because uh, um, Bastian tells us that RDS is so easy. It took me three weeks to get it. And the first thing I got with the stupid RDS is indeed the autocorrelation. And once I got the autocorrelation, I need another three weeks to figure out how to get the bits out, how to get the, 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 the correlation things. So autocorrelation is really something that sh should be the first thing tested whenever to, we want to check whether the signal is, uh, integrity is correct. So autocorrelation is, is a very powerful tool indeed. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.